described as the most rapidly prominent French philosopher in the Anglophone world since Jack Derrida, and by Zizek as beginning a new epoch, Quinton Mayasu's philosophy is notoriously difficult to categorise. In his brilliant study of French philosophy today, Christopher Watkin does his best to characterise the leading French philosophers he discusses in terms of belief. There are atheists, Mayasu while others situate themselves in a religious tradition. So that is simple enough. According to Watkin, Mayasu is an atheist. As an authority on his teacher, Badur, categorising Mayasu this way would make perfect sense. And this would make perfect sense of the fact that Mayasu can also be designated a materialist, despising any appeal to the supersensible or transcendent. So, that could not be plainer. Quinton Massieu is a materialistic atheist. But not so fast. When discussing the establishment of justice in our world, how many materialistic atheists could write, it is only the world of rebirth of humans that makes universal justice possible by erasing the injustice of shattered lives. Another name is the world of justice, in which humans attain immortality they richly deserve. The core of ethics thus consists in the messianic hope, understood as the hope for justice for the dead and the living. For only those who comprehend the utterly staggering character of our own existence know that even resurrection will be less astonishing. Now, all this talk of immortality, resurrection, messianic hope and the rebirth of humans in a new world to come is not some anomalous aberration for Mayasu. This, I assure you, constitutes a major theme on which Mayasu's philosophy stands and according to him, any hope for justice must be grounded. When the requirement of justice transfixes us, it also summons our refusal of injustice for the dead, for recent and ancient deaths, for known and unknown deaths, for the universal is universal only when it makes no exceptions. And of all these injustices, the most extreme is still death, absurd death, early death, death inflicted by those unconcerned with equality. Hence, those who exercise their humanity can only hope for the recommencement of our lives in such a way that justice should surpass the factual death that has struck down our fellow human. The core of ethics thus consists in the messianic hope understood as the hope for justice for the dead and the living. Now, of course, as the philosopher Graham Harmon points out, in the Western context, the resurrection of the dead has previously seemed like a special doctrine of the Christian faith, and it is among the first to be scoffed at by those who reject this religion. But Mayasu revives the doctrine. Mayasu's eschatology not only envisages a resurrection of the dead in a transformed world, but sees this as the work of an eschatological god. Mayasu also envisages an act of mediation in the form of incarnation. The mediator ought to be a person whose action is guided by the universal goodness. This person has the power voluntarily to accomplish the rebirth of the dead, omnipotence. Only in this way does the mediator accomplish the world of justice. Mayasu, in fact, sees this incarnation in terms of the birth of a child. But what this exactly entails is not crystal clear. One commentator has helpfully summarised what Mayasu seems to be suggesting. Although Mayasu's description of the literal birth are vague, the birth of the child marks a key moment in the messianic eschatology. In short, the child represents the supreme abandonment of power during the time in which the Christ-like messianic figure, a mediator, assumes the power of rebirth, inaugurates a process of bodily resurrection so that justice can be brought about for the dead, and relinquish power once this justice has been accomplished 
for which the advent was this event's founding condition. Thus, the child is a human mediator between humanity's current world and universal justice. What is one to make of a contemporary French philosopher who argues for what can only be seen as a form of biblical eschatology, with all the trimmings, without a hint of irony, or demythologizing? As Harmon comments, a new French philosopher born in the late 1960s emerges from a deeply materialistic and leftist background. In principle, it should be easy to predict his attitude towards the topic of God. His atheism should be sh safely assured, but that is not quite what we find. As another commentator continues, what may strike readers as surprising, even disturbing, are the Christian overtones. He embraces a possibility that resonates strongly with the Christian doctrine of resurrection of the dead, involving a human figure who somehow comes into possession of divine power but gives it up after returning all those who have died to life, bestowing upon all humanity the gift of a new immortal form of bodily existence. So, as Graham Harmon concludes... One can only admire his audacity in leading an ostensibly materialist philosophy to the realm of a Christ-like mediator and a virtual God. For the theologian, reading Matthew feels like an outrageous dream. For who could have predicted that a high-profile French materialist would argue for the coming of God? an eschatological resurrection of the dead, preceded by an incarnation. But for the traditional atheist, it must feel more like a nightmare. For the suggestion that humanity is in need of an act of God, giving us hope in a world to come, must stick firmly in the throat of any secular humanist. That there is something fundamentally deficient in life without eschatological salvation is surely the rhetoric of the believer, not the atheist. In fact, in this respect, Matthew can go as far to suggest that atheism without eschatology is hopelessly nihilistic. As Matthew states, not believing in God leads to the impasse, sadness, timidity, cynicism, and the disparagement of what makes us human. It is the imminent form of despair. The shrill and desperate consciousness of godless human condition leads to no pacific act other than perhaps suicide. The real possibility of the world of eschatological justice removes the hopeless absurdity found in the case of every ideal that results from its ontological impossibility. Atheism diminishes humans and humiliates their projects. As Christopher Watkins sums it up, the atheist cries against the crimes and outrages of the centuries simply echo back and forth down the endless hollow corridors of a meaningless universe, and all the innocent suffering of the generations is muffled and forgotten in the superbly impassive indifference of the cosmos. At this point, Matthew makes the interesting observation that classical atheism in this way largely accepts the religious account of the human condition. So the classical atheist, admitting that the territory of imminence is just as religion describes it, declares that this territory is the only one that exists. Finally, one invents every possible way of rendering it livable despite the fact. Therefore, according to Maosu, Having wrongly accepted the truth of this predicament, the atheist has two options, renunciation and revolt. In renunciation, the atheist explicitly recognises the misery of the condition of imminence. It is an attitude of mourning, a gloomy intellectual asceticism with stoical overtones. As for revolt, it consists in heroically assuming the imminence such as religion describes it. In neither case does the priest have to worry, for the simple reason that his adversary regrets being right. In the case of renunciation, 
the regret is explicit. In the case of revolt, it is masked but still obvious. So, according to Mayasu, the only remedy that is offered is distraction. To forget as best one can about the reality of the harsh and heartless world and amuse oneself with something else. The only renunciation of hope is smoothing. It is renunciation of hope which knows how to build mere carcass as soft as a coffin, which assures me to the moment of death, not thinking of death. What is never said is that the harshest mourning is that of the atheist, who knows how to harden himself to the thought of the unavoidable end to the point of repressing it from his daily preoccupations. Mayasu is only too aware how difficult it is to be completely distracted. Even in those who refuse God to humans, despairing of their world in the weakness of the ends they propose, one can be very sure of discovering those who are too often heard praying at the altar, fleeing this world that is so overwhelming because it is so false, which the atheist thus means to impose on them. In these terms, Matthew can sound like the classic defector, despairing of the secular environment in which he has been raised, renouncing its godless propaganda and then crossing its iron curtain to the better place. In doing this, he reveals to all the uncomfortable truth that even though for most of modernity, atheists have been telling us that they are perfectly content without God and mocking anyone who needs religion. Unbeknown to us, according to Matthew, they have all been subject to a psychology of denial. Every time the media reports a scientific breakthrough, to make it sound momentous, we are told that this has the potential to explain the very origins of life itself. The underlying implication being, here is yet another reason why we don't need God. But on this topic, yet again, Mayasu is full of surprises. As he states, the advent of material configurations that could support life or thought now seem highly unlikely in the light of known physical laws. Whether we are speaking of the appearance of the first constitutes of life, of the evolution of species, or of the emergence and evolution of the human brain. As Graham Harmon's study of Mayasu's philosophy explains, the usual materialist approach holds that life is potentially locked in matter, and that it necessarily arises from a certain configuration of that matter. That would amount to the claim that the effects are a possible property of matter in the same manner as nuclear fission. The claim is that life and thought lie dormant in matter, with certain tendencies towards them later appearing in full-blown form. But for Masu, matter is purely lifeless, with no incipient life harboured in its depth, and this fact imposes a pure discontinuity between matter and vital content. From all we've heard thus far from Matthew, we might get the impression that he would be sympathetic to religious faith. But that could not be further from the truth. The book that shot Matthew to philosophical stardom after finitude begins with a sustained attack on the way that continental philosophy since Immanuel Kant has created philosophical space for what he sees as irrational religious faith. Matthew argues that Kant's philosophical distinction between phenomena and noumena has largely set the agenda for continental philosophy. That being the distinction between the fully processed object of human thought and consciousness and the thing in itself prior to that processing. So Kant is claiming that it is not possible, in Mayasu's words, 
of discriminating between those properties of the world which are a function of our relation to it and those properties of the world as it is in itself, subsisting indifferently to our relation to it. Because thought cannot get outside of itself in order to compare the world as it is in itself to the world as it is for us and thereby distinguish what is a function of our relation to the world and what belongs to the world alone. We cannot represent the in itself without it becoming for us. Or as Hegel amusingly puts it, we cannot creep up on the object from behind so as to find out what it is in itself, which means that we cannot know anything that would be beyond our relation to the world. So, as Christopher Watkin concludes, the correlationist, according to Matthew, knows along with Kant that there is an absolute, but has no access to the absolute in itself, only to its correlation with the categories of our thought. This, according to Matthew, has become the obligatory framework for all modern thought. As we have seen, Matthew gives this ubiquitous tendency that he sees as so fundamental to post-Kantian philosophy, the term correlationism. By correlation, we mean the idea according to which we only have access to the correlation between thinking and being, and never either term considered apart from the other. Consequently, it becomes possible to say that every philosophy which disavows naive realism has become a variant of correlationism. Therefore, Matthew begins his seminal work after finishude by arguing that the central notion of modern philosophy since Kant seems to be that of correlationism. When applying this thesis to philosophy since 1900, Matthew argues that during the 20th century, the two principal media of correlation were consciousness and language. The former being phenomenology, the latter variant currents of analytic philosophy. To paraphrase the words of the Apostle Paul, for 20th century philosophy, it is always within these two, consciousness and language, that we live and move and have our being. In summing this up, Matthew quotes the philosopher Wolf. We are in consciousness or language as in a transparent cage. Everything is outside, yet it is impossible to get out. So as Mayasu concludes, the transcendental phenomenology or postmodernism denies thought all access to the absolute. Tragically, according to Mayasu, this modern correlationism has led to the triumph of faith. For, as we have seen, following Immanuel Kant, Reason can only know what the mind has processed and cannot know a reality in itself beyond that mental processing. But if in this way reason is limited to only working within the transparent cage of conceptual thought, what is beyond is free from reason's jurisdiction. In this way it leaves the ultimate nature of things not only inaccessible to reason but also beyond reason's critical control or governance. So, according to Maasu, in post-Kantian thought ultimate reality has become a reason-free zone. But the worrying consequence of all this for Maasu is that where reason fails to preside faith will have its rational way and be given free reign. A faith, as Matthew argues, with no rational restraint. This reign of faith, without rational restraint, Matthew rightly calls feedism. Therefore, according to Matthew, post-Kantian correlationism has inadvertently justifies beliefs claims to be the only means of access to the absolute. And this will lead to feedism faith pitched against faith since what determines our fundamental choices cannot be rationally proved this has happened Matthew believes because of the post-Kantian embargo on speculative metaphysics where classical metaphysics before Kant had reasoned about the nature of ultimate reality 
after Kant's restriction of reason to the realm of phenomena, this would mean the end of all speculative metaphysics. This means that faith is given free reign in probably the area that matters most. In Maasu's words, Fideism inevitably consists in a sceptical argument directed against the pretensions of metaphysics and of reason more generally. But it is our conviction that the contemporary end of metaphysics is nothing more than a victory for Fideism. On this point, the contemporary philosopher has completely capitulated to the man of faith. If there is an ultimate truth, only piety can provide it, not thought. Maasu sees this as exemplified in the two pillars of 20th century philosophy, Wittgenstein and Heidegger. Wittgenstein and Heidegger are emblematic representations of this thought, and far from inaugurating a radical break with the past in this matter, both remain heirs to the legacy of a venerable and well-documented Fidesz tradition, whose anti-metaphysical character has always been intended to protect piety from the incursions of rationality, and which reach its culminating point in these two thinkers. The mystical invoked in Wittgenstein's Tractatus, or the theology that Heidegger admitted he had long considered writing. As Graham Harmon concludes, for Maasu, strong correlationism is linked with numerous distasteful trends in the contemporary world. Fideism, scepticism, fanaticism, and the return to the religious in general. Insofar as strong correlationism thinks no rational statement about the in itself is possible, it leads directly to fideism. At the heart of this fideism, what Maasu calls the faith of the priest, is what he believes is the rationality of revelation. By contrast, philosophy must be different, both from the absurd and hopeless world of the sophist, who sees value in nothing but convention, and from the transcendent world of the religious person, who ascribes value in the world by a rational means of a revelation, a tradition, an authority. Anti-philosophers always give way for the priest, since, with the limitations they place on meaning, they inaugurate a field of nonsense that tacitly legitimates a revelation of a transcendence exceeding all logos. In the next video, we will ask, how consistent is it for Masu to advocate such an explicit eschatology, but also be so disparaging towards revelation.